Well, it's great to be here with you today. I'm going to speak here as I walk across here. Uh, first, Deanna, let's give it up for Deanna. That was awesome. Woohoo! Really great energy. So, let's see, we got my slides ready. Uh, so how many have been to the expo already? I'm going to start with an uh, analogy around that. Okay, we have, we have a few. I went a couple days ago, and I'm so inspired by the innovation and creativity that our collective world has to offer. And so we're here today to talk about competency-based education from kindergarten to college and some uh, real practical solutions any of you can implement literally tomorrow. So we've got some great stuff here. But I'm going to pose... Kind of a bold question, again, at, coming after the, the Dubai, the World Expo, can competency-based education solve world hunger, poverty, cancer, addiction, robot takeover of jobs? It's a real thing, right? Can competency-based education affect these world challenges? I'm going to say yes. I believe that if we implement and change the education system to be more competency-based models, we can affect these world's challenges. Because competency-based education creates self-directed lifelong learners who are creative, curious, and motivated to solve these problems. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is how, to, how you can implement a few tiny steps to get started a competency-based approach to education from K to college. Okay? Back up a little bit. Let me introduce myself. I'm Matt, Matt Bowman. Nice to meet all of you. This is a picture of my family. Uh, we have three boys, two girls, two daughter-in-laws, a son-in-law, and a little grandbaby up top. So we're pretty excited about our family. Uh, I've been in education for almost 30 years. And actually, today's my birthday, so I was reflecting back on that. It's kind of fun. Thank you. Uh, I have my bachelor's and master's degree in education. I've also attended uh, Stanford's Ex Executive Business Management Program. Um, and, I, you know, I was born to two educators. My parents were both educators, and I started my first education company when I was 17. And I'm currently the founder and CEO of several ed uh, education organizations serving almost 20,000 students globally. So I really am excited to share some of the things that I have learned, and I invite all of you to identify through this conference some little moments of innovation that you can take back to your job and implement them. You can make a difference just going back and Im implementing one thing that we talked about today. So let's get into it. I started my teaching career in the state of Washington. I taught sixth grade. And during that time, this was in the 90s, the state launched a grant to bring this new thing called the internet into my classroom in 1996. Most teachers scoffed at it, said, I don't want that thing in my classroom. I don't know what it is. And I said, I'll do it. And I, turns out the internet was kind of a cool thing and has impacted education globally ever since. And since that time, I've been involved with online education public school choice models, innovation in education, and really excited about some of the things that I can share with you today. How many are Harry Potter fans in the room? Raise your hand. Oh, just a few. Okay. So I invite you to read book five of Harry Potter. If you just want to educate, like I think J.K. Rowling was one of the most underrated education reform authors ever, and most people don't even know it. Book five she indicts the standardized public education system, in my opinion. And if you read it with that in mind, you'll be amazed at what she is trying to demonstrate around self-directed, competency-based learning. Harry Potter and his friends want to learn stuff that they want to learn. They want to be self-directed learners. And this big, mean professor, um, Umbridge, says, no, you must stick to the standards. You must stick to standardized education and testing. You must only learn theory. They wanted hands-on practical uh, experiences, so they had to go into a secret room and teach themselves, no adults, all self-directed learning, hours and hours of practice. A competency-based model was being implemented in Harry Potter Book 5. So I, it's kind of a fun analogy if you read it. 
And again, of everything there is to talk about competency-based education, there's, I, I've just only, I've picked these three as areas of focus that I think to me are the most uh, practical ways to get started in any entity that you're in involved with education. And they are individualized, flexible pacing, educational transparency, and competency-based grading. So we're going to cover those three things today, and I hope they inspire you to say, how can I implement this in my job, in my experience, my organization tomorrow? Because you really can. Okay, first, individualized, flexible pacing. Raise your hand if you've ever studied child development. Any child development? Okay, how about then raise your hand if you work with kids or have children of your own. Hopefully many of us. Raise your hand if you think that every child learns at exact same pace. What? Nobody? <laughs> Wait a minute, but we batch everybody by birth year and zip code in our systems. Don't we expect them all to learn everything at exact same pace? Or else they're, fall, they're behind or they're ahead or they're bored or they're, they're, they're struggling. It does kind of not make much sense that we batch kids by birth year and zip code. We need a better way to think about how to help students progress on their own individual pace. So let's, I'm gonna share a couple student stories about this. First one is Sam. Sam at five years old was, was tested and assessed as profoundly gifted. He was living in Indiana at the time in the, in the United States and he went into his, he and his mom went into his principal at their school, and the principal said, Sam, your pace is too accelerated. The K-12 system has nothing more to offer you. Good luck on your own. And that's sad, but that's kind of what we say to kids who are accelerated. Say, oh, we don't have anything for you. And if they're too far, far behind, we struggle as we move them up and up and up. We can do a lot better than that. Sam is, in our, is currently in our Utah program, uh, one of the many programs that we run. He's thriving. We have actually, he's in our K-12 program, but we've fed him with college-level classes, access to professors and experts, and all kinds of resources, and he's thriving. He's 13 years old now, and he absolutely loves it. Uh, and he actually, a couple years ago, became one of the youngest students ever to be named U.S. Presidential Scholar. So we're pretty proud about Sam, and we do have something to offer him because we allow for competency-based learning at your own pace. We don't stick them into a box and say, hey, you could only learn eighth grade material this year. We say, what can we bring to you in terms of resources and help you learn at your own pace? Another story, Mary, she was a student in my class, a sixth grade student in Yakima, Washington. She came to school one day and said, hey, Mr. Bowman, I got to tell you something. And I said, yeah, Mary, tell me what's going on in your life. And she said, well, my parents are illegal immigrants. And at the warehouse that they're working at today, the rumor is that the immigration services is going to swoop them up and take them back to Mexico. And me and my brother, I don't know where we're going to live tonight. Should I have said that's... That's not important. You need to focus on standardized test prep. Of course not. I said, Mary, of, of, of course. What can I do for you? And she said, can I pause my learning for a little bit without falling behind? Is there a way that I can just press pause and deal with some emergencies in my life? And of course. But our system's not really set up to do that. You're going to be behind. You're... But yes, competency-based models allow for students to pause their learning for a time and not be behind when they do so. And isn't it kind of like all of us? We sometimes pause in life. We need to take a break from work or school. Let's let kids do the same. Sometimes it's okay for them to pause without getting behind. On the other end, let those that are wanting to not pause but run. If you've been a teacher, raise your hand if you've ever told the accelerated kid, when you're done, just read quietly, tell everyone else is. Has everyone done that one? I did. That's about all I knew what to do is just don't do it, you know, or go help others. 
I, we, we don't give them more. We just say, just wait. We can do a lot better than that. And competency-based education allows for accelerated growth, especially when you include college and career in that path, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Kindergarten to college and career allows you to have kid, not be afraid if kids are ready to run. All right, so I have three of these slides. The wouldn't it be great if, kind of the magic wand, if we can imagine this, the little cameras in the corner, if you want to uh, take a picture after the slides done. These are one of three I have in my deck today. Wouldn't it be great if all students had unlimited access to high quality, locally adaptable, competency-based digital curriculum, accessible on any device, spanning across every subject and grade level from kindergarten to college and career, with mentor and teacher support all along the way, all at the learner's individualized pace. Wouldn't it be great if we had that? Y'all, raise your hand if you like that. That sounds good? All right, so that's one of three we're gonna, the, of the wouldn't it be great ifs. We'll come back to the next ones. Topic number two. Educational transparency. Boy, this is one that I really am a big proponent of. I'm from Utah, so a home of the 2002 Salt Lake uh, Winter Olympics. So I, was I thought, hey, I'm going to throw in a snowboarding uh, example here for this presentation. Anyone in here snowboarded before? Okay, we had a couple, all right. How many, any watched the Winter Olympics 2022, the ones in China last month? Okay, if you did, you actually saw some demonstrations of educational transparency, but you didn't even know it. Because behind the scenes on a snowboard run is a set of criteria with deductions. Every snowboarder knows before they go into the, their run what they're going to be judged on. Would we ever tell snowboarders to train for years and years and years and then show up at an event and not know what they're going to be judged on? No, that, that'd, that'd be crazy. We wouldn't have, snowboarders wouldn't accept that. They need to know what they're going to be judged on before they do their run. Makes sense, doesn't it? So, but we don't do that in education. We keep things secretive, standardized tests, no one can see them. Let's not tell kids what they're going to be tested on. We're going to trick them into failure because we need to keep this bell curve. We don't do educational transparency in the, t in the traditional education system. Competency-based education models are the best way to do educational transparency by showing kids what it is they need to do to perform and demonstrate that they're competent and ready to move on. We're all familiar with this quote from Einstein, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing it's stupid. So that inspired this cartoon. A bunch of animals down here. The judge says, for a fair selection, everybody needs to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. You see the faces of... The bird, the monkey, the cat, they're excited. What about the fish, and the elephant, and the penguin? They want to climb a tree? If we told the fishes and the elephants and the penguins, hey, join our public education system, we're going to judge you on your ability to climb a tree, would they want to join? No. I want an education system that is accessible for all kids, not just the tree climbers. Can we do it? Competency-based education allows for that. It lets people go at different paces, different paths, and it gives them the transparency of expectation on knowing how they're supposed to succeed. This third story is personal. This is my daughter. Her name's Eliza. She's the youngest of five, as I mentioned, with three boys and two girls, so she's our youngest. Every year, my wife, who's in the room with me, by the way, uh, my wife and I would approach our children every summer and say, this is your education. 
you design your ideal education plan and present it to us, and let's see if we can accommodate as much as we can for the school year. That was just what we did every summer. And it was fascinating to see what they came up with. Charter schools, district schools, online, virtual, homeschool, community education, all kinds of different models we threw in. And it was great. Eliza, as a junior, so she was uh, 16 years old, she had chosen her district school. She was a three-sport athlete, had lots of friends, and we thought she was a great tree climber. She was performing fine, doing well, but she came home one break and said, I really like to learn, but why is schooling so painful? I was like, oh, well, what can we do? She said, I, you know, I'm, I have high anxiety, I'm stressed out, all my friends are stressed, we're always preparing for tests, and it's just like learning is fun, but why is schooling painful? And so my wife and I sat down and we looked at different options and we came across a competency-based associate degree. And I've been a fan ever since. She jumped into that. It introduced this model of mastered or not yet grading, which will be our third point here today. And she thrived. In 14 months, she finished her full associate degree and she timed it well enough to then walk with her friends on graduation day at her high school. But since then, four of our five children have all earned a competency-based college degree. So I can speak both as a father and as an educator. I would not recommend anything else. It truly is the best educational model for kids to learn at their own pace with educational transparency and a master to not yet grading model. Pretty exciting. So here's number two. Wouldn't it be great if students had clear, consistent expectations for success? To reduce this confusion, stress, anxiety so prevalent among, that Deanna mentioned, the stress and anxiety amongst our youth is so high, it's because we're cramming them into standardized boxes that don't have educational transparency. Uh, let's help students develop a love of lifelong learning to nurture this creativity, curiosity, and motivation. And that's going to solve the world problems that we face. Okay, our third and final, competency-based grading. Oh, and again, this picture on the, on the, instead of, fail means F. The traditional A to F grading model was adopted from industrial meatpacking solutions. Like, we can do so much better than that, and kids want a more authentic way to be assessed through a mastered and not yet grading model. Uh, again, failure is something that we teach. So Edison, inventor, inventor of the light bulb, I've not failed 10,000 times. I have not failed once. I have succeeded in proving that those 10,000 ways will not work. He viewed failure as a healthy part of a learning process, not a bad part. How many have ever heard someone say, if you don't do what I'm saying, I'm going to fail you. Like failure is the worst possible thing humans can experience. Yet we do that for kids. We make them think, think that failure is bad. It's not. How many, oh, let me show you an example. I, I, you know, I'm a big sports fan. Uh, lots of kids that I've worked with are a big sports fan. And, and here's why they think the A to F grading scale is ridiculous. Because again, you know, 95% is an A. 85% of B's, you know, and then it down to D is 65%, and everything below that's an F. You're a failure. And then they go watch their sports legends. How many know these three? Cristiano Ronaldo, arguably one of the best soccer players in the world. Tom Brady, American football quarterback, one of the best to ever play. Michael Jordan, arguably one of the best basketball players to ever play the sport. Let's judge them on our traditional education system. Okay? You ready? Cristiano Ronaldo, his job is to score goals. Guess what? He has only scored goals in 42% of the games he's played. His job is to score. He's only scored in 40%. Oh, let's give him an F. 
the greatest soccer player arguably the plays. 42% is all that he's scored in. Tom Brady, he did a little bit better. Again, as a quarterback, his job is to throw the ball. Throw it. Just like we tell kids, just do your tests. Tom's supposed to throw the ball. His career completion percentage, not bad, 64%. But just under that 65%, we're going to give him an F. But you know what? Maybe if he brings his teacher a cake, he can get a D minus. Right? We'll give him a little extra credit. Michael Jordan, best score, most beautiful basketball player ever to play. He was just supposed to shoot and make baskets. What was his career completion percentage? 49%. F. This is what kids look at. They're like, well, if all my sports heroes only score 40% of the time well, and that's celebrated as the best ever, how is this grading system applying to me make any sense? It doesn't. So it's time to change. How many have seen the most watched ever TED Talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity by Sir Ken Robinson? Anyone? Okay. If you haven't, you got to go watch Do Schools Kill Creativity because the answer is yes. They do. And what his other quote related to that, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. How can we come up with original, innovative solutions to our world's problems if we're killing the curiosity out of kids in school? We can do better. And honestly, through competency-based education, through transparency, individualized pacing, and a competency-based grading model, we can help them innovate faster, accelerate solutions to these problems that we face, and make a hundred times the Expo, the World Expo solutions that we saw when we went there. So let me drive, drill a little deeper into this mastered or not yet. I just am passionate about this principle. Because first of all, how many in the room, raise your hand if you have mastered everything in life? Come on. Deanna's close. She was close. Okay, some of you have not yet in your life? I do. There's a whole list of not yet that I'm working on, I'm developing, I'm, I'm growing. And yet we tell kids, hey, if you haven't mastered it, if you haven't mastered that by nine years old, I'm going to give you an F and call you behind. That's messed up. <laughs> Let's give them the opportunity to feel like they're on a path towards mastery, even if they have a stack of not yet. That's what my daughter did. She loved her not yet. She would submit her project. The grader would come back with the rubric that says, you've mastered these four things. You're a not yet on these three things. She'd work till midnight on her not yet. She'd submit it again. She'd get it back. Oh, two more moved to mastered. One still a not yet. She'd work on the not yet and resubmit. Oh, it's still not yet. That's learning. Versus her peers would go take one test and get a C. I don't know what I missed. I don't know what I didn't know. But my daughter was able to see her not yet and convert those to mastered. Isn't that powerful? So mastered or not yet can work. So third and final, wouldn't it be great if we stop teaching students that failure is a bad thing? by moving from an A to F grading scale to a mastered or not yet approach. And you can do this in your traditional settings. Yes, your bureaucrats all say you need an A to F or something, then just say it's either A or incomplete. Like just adopt the mentality. You don't have to change the whole world. Just go and say, you know what? We're not gonna do A through F, we're gonna do A and incomplete. And as soon as you finish your incomplete, you get an A. Email me if anyone tells you you can't do that. Okay, And all of this will help students better develop creativity, creative th critical thinking, problem solving, and spur innovation in our homes, community, and world. Isn't that what we want? 
So wouldn't it be great if we could do that? So to recap, close out our session today. Current school system, standardized pacing, batching children by birth year, expecting them all to learn at the same pace. But you know what? Even if fish could climb a tree, would they all do it at the same pace? No, the shark would just jump up and the little goldfish would take its time. That's okay. Lack of transparency. Boy, federal and state accountability measures that try to judge education on a standardized test score is just wrong. There's no, there's no support for that in terms of child development, uh, individualized pacing. The secretive standardized testing model has just got to go. And the traditional grading scale. F means failure. We got to get away from that. Kids see that life is so much more rich than an A to F grading scale. They want something much more authentic. Show them what they're going to be mass they're going to be graded on. Give them repeated opportunities to then resolve that. In this competency model, let's give flexible pacing. Give opportunities to kids to pause if they have emergencies and run if they want to run. Give clear and consistent expectations. Don't hide behind, oh, I can't tell you what's on the test. I'm here. The testing should be allowed for what are my expectations? How am I going to master those? How can I demonstrate competency for those? Not be secretive. And grading, mastered or not yet. Again, repeated, repeated opportunities to achieve mastery. Well, I have some great news. This kind of thing does exist all on one platform, K to college and career. And we can help you implement it actually in about a day. It's that easy, actually. <laughs> it's the human time that takes time, but you can implement this literally starting today. That's what we do. We do it well. Come chat with them. One of my colleagues is here in the room today who helped build this whole system. K to college and career, never changing your platform so you don't get lost in all the Zoom links. One platform, K to college and career, affordable, accredited, everything that you need. And here's what it looks like. Here's a, here's a screenshot. For example, we partner with a college, Snow College. So when, just make the squares green. That's all you gotta tell the kids. All your expectations, all your outlines, you have repeated attempts at the quizzes and tests and assignments. Just make the squares green. Seriously, that's, that's it. And guess what? Once all those are green, we'll give you a U.S. accredited high school diploma and a regionally accredited, which is the highest level of accreditation in the U.S., U.S. college associate degree diploma. And you've never had to leave the platform from kindergarten through that experience. And actually, on the career side, we have certifications with AWS, leadership programs, Google certs, those kinds of things that you can also earn career-based industry certification through college credit that way. Kind of cool. Next, let's remind ourselves now, Matt, that sounds optimistic. Will it benefit the world? I believe yes. That's what I believe. Let's do it. I believe that if we implement it right, young people will begin to love learning again. Teachers and parents and local leaders will work together and they'll, they'll enjoy their children that aren't so stressed out all the time and find solutions to local community problems faster. And our whole world will see accelerated innovation that benefits everyone on planet Earth. We truly can make a difference if we do this. If we help self -direct, create self-directed lifelong learners who are creative, curious, and motivated, we'll find solutions to our world's problems instead of just tweeting about them. They can do it. Let's arm them with that ability. And world hunger doesn't stand a chance. If we help kids inspire their curiosity, creativity, and motivation to solve it, they can do it. I don't know what the answers are, but we can help create that environment that will lead to those solutions. Last slide. 
Remember, learning doesn't happen inside a school or a building or even a home. Learning happens inside a learner. Thank you. Hello. Do you want to do questions still? One more. Hello, hello. Hey, it's working. We're live. All right. Give him a round of applause. Matt has done an incredible job. Thank you, Matt. You know, I love, personally, I say, imagine your life if you were taught by what you're good at and not by a test you had to remember. Imagine. Thank you. Right? Yes. And, and, and imagine that. Take a moment to think about your life right now. If you didn't have to study for that test that you don't remember any of those answers, how would your life be different? So the power is un, you know, unimaginable. So thank you so much for that. I want to open it up for other people. Who else has a question for Matt? Gentlemen, yes. Stand up. Tell us who you are. Where Hi, are you Matt. From? Uh, my name is Benoit. I'm from India. Uh, great presentation, once thank again. You. Thank you. And from what I could understand, you're trying to say is individuality over community. You know, you are a person, you are an individual, and your competencies matter to you more than as a group. And this is something I'm a big proponent of in my, in my institute too. But there's a question that plagues me all the time. Is there a middle way? Because this is disruptive. It's decades of institutionalized teaching, and we are trying to disrupt it. Is it really an either or? Like, we go by the traditional way, or we try to disrupt it. Or is there a middle way that could work cohesively taking the best out of what already existed and what we're trying to do? do you yeah, have? great question. So the answer is yes, there is a middle way. It is not an either or. And I definitely would say, I regularly say move towards a competency-based education model. Because it, you can't just drop a thousand years of, of a model uh, and implement something else. But it's moving towards a competency-based education model that you can implement some of these things um, in a regular setting that's very traditional. Try something like on this assignment, you can either get mastered or not yet, and if you're not yet, you can keep submitting it until you get mastered, just on one assignment. And then maybe on another one, a different assignment, you test educational transparency. Say, hey everybody, here's a rubric that you're gonna be judged on. Creativity, colors, does it have a map, does it have whatever, and here's the point value for each thing. Grade it yourself, have your friend grade it, have another person grade it, all using that same rubric. And that's implementing transparency of education, that you know ahead of time what it is you're gonna be judged on. And the other is flexible pacing. Take your time, let people run, let people slow down and not judge them as Everyone must be here every Friday. So there are some things you can implement in a traditional classroom to just get you more towards self-directed learners, developing creativity, curiosity, and motivation. I hope that helps. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you for that. We got another question. Hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth Percy. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. I'm a chief trainer in genetic analysis, and I totally agree with you. It's just amazing. This is the way we train nice. in the UAE. Way to go. And uh, this is the visionary founder for such kind of training in UAE. We are just two years old, but this is our ground where we train adults and children this way. And we have seen children come out of such cases where they are in trauma because of school and they're unable to speak because of parents at home. They put certain pressures on the children. The school teacher puts pressures, but they come out of it eventually. So it takes around zero to six months to get them sorted, but we also do it by biometrics, so we know their genetic analysis towards it, and then we bring them out of it, and the brain and its neuroplasticity allows it to happen. And uh, we are under the government of Dubai, and we do it here. Congratulations. Let's give them a round of applause. And here's what, I would, here's what I would add to what you're already doing. Let's partner, and the kids, if they want, can get a U.S. diploma and a U.S. college degree all at the same time without much difference. That would be great. Yeah, if that's a value of interest. Great opportunity. Look at that. You don't even have to leave the UAE. <laughs> no, you can stay right? right here. You can stay right here. Amazing. The Americans are coming here to the UAE. <laughs> what an idea. Okay, another question. 
Yes, there's a microphone over there. Let us know who you are and what company you're from, please. Microphone's not on. Hold on for a second there. Thank you. Thanks so much. So my name is Tatia Trinkoli from Germany. Hi. It's International Institute, Institute for Studies and Cooperation. First of all, thank you very much for your um, speech. It was great. I have searched a bit about the internet about you, and it happened you are have a massive career. <laughs> you became from a really dishwasher to kind of thinker. I wouldn't say a millionaire, but a thinker, a person who made it big. But Thank you. I really am interested um, when this learning, uh, learning process started really in you. Like, you know, you, you told them the last word learning happens inside the learner, you know. And I have read you kind of mastered uh, your public relations skills only in one month. And you kind of became a really grand in this uh, section. Can you just say some kind of personal things about you that you can motivate us to do great things here? Well, thank you. Uh, um, sure. So why, where did learning begin? I have to give credit to my parents. And, and uh, they created an environment that education was valued. And uh, But, you know, they were very traditional. And so most of my growing up years was fairly traditional in the sense of I performed well, but I didn't really know if I was learning or not. Uh, learning was secondary to just making sure I was getting all the right grades or whatever. Um, but then I did start into this entrepreneurship world. And that's really where I think my mind shifted to accelerating innovation is this entrepreneurship bug that I have inside. And, and our program today focuses on developing entrepreneurship skills in, in young people. And I'd encourage all of you to think about what kind of ways can you test a little bit of your own entrepreneurial spirit? Because I think through entrepreneurship is one of the best ways that I have seen myself develop and learn those things that I wanted to learn versus someone telling me what I needed to learn. Entrepreneurship was my motivator to do that. So go start a business, even a small one, and you'll be amazed at what you learn from Google AdWords to social media, SEO, to building a website, to marketing, to finance. There's so many elements of entrepreneurship that are really grounded in huge learning, but it's very motivating. So I hope that helps. There's Thank a question you for back that. Here. We have a mic in the back. Oh, hold on, mic's not on. Mike, just press see if there's that on button on this. You able to see any green color go on? Sometimes when we hold the mics, we're turning it off. The sound should be getting there in just a second. Anyway, I, I'm going to be moving along. Anyone find Matt on LinkedIn? Raise your hand if you found Matt on LinkedIn. There's a, right. there's a lot of Matt Bowmans on LinkedIn. so <laughs> Matt Dot. Matt Dot. You got it on? Perfect. Yeah, I, I got it on now. Okay. Hey, uh, Matt, great presentation. My name's Kenneth. I, a, I am a superintendent of schools in VIA Suzhou, China. So what I heard you say is, could my students that live in China work and on their schoolwork and finish a high school diploma working through you and get an associate's degree in college credit while still being in China? Yes to both. Wow. So what you're saying is that, uh, and it's a competency-based model, so if my students, uh, our Chinese students tend to be extremely motivated, not necessarily smarter than anybody else, but they tend to study for 10, 20 hours a day, it seems. So they could go faster and finish their diploma faster in your system? They could. We, we had a student last semester earn 32 college credits in one semester. Wow. Is all you can eat as fast as you can go for all one price. And so a student in China could do that and earn perhaps their U.S. associate degree and high school diploma within a matter of a semester or two, depending on how fast they want to run. And just one last question, then I'll let you go, is... Uh in China, we have a lot of universities that will come and say they're offering credit. Is this an accredited university in the United States? Is it one that could transfer credits anywhere to any university, whether it's the U.S. or Australia? Yeah, great question. The, the, the partner school we work with is fully accredited. Their credit's transferred to every university in the world. Okay, that's amazing. So Thank you can you. finish up that associate degree and then go transfer to another university to finish your bachelor's degree and do that elsewhere, and great. All right. Hey, thank you, Matt. Thanks. 
Amazing, amazing. Great idea. Who else wants to if talk to Matt? I have a question, if I may. Hello, of course you may, since you got the thank microphone. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's Can't say no to that, Rachel. I'm, no, go for it. You got it. So, first of all, thanks, Matt, for a great presentation. And I must say, I mean, fully uh, embrace what, what you shared today. Thank you. I mean, uh, CBL, this is what we practice at school. Uh, sharing the rubrics so the kids know ahead of time what they need to work towards, right? And how to achieve mastery of whatever we, uh, awesome. we put in front of them. Um, and actually, I want to make draw a link to the previous presentation, previous speaker, uh, Diana, this morning, because we talked about in difficult times in the pandemic, right? And this is one thing that actually the pandemic helped us realize that the importance of human connections in learning Right, because we, we went from so many schools in a model where it's all academic cognitive learning and the socio emotional part is very is like a second class citizen, right? Um, and all of a sudden we realize that wow, we can't really teach these kids without this. And they need it. So my question to you is what is the role of a teacher when you have a fully um, comprehensive plat uh, yeah, online platform for these kids to learn? Basically, they could do it without a teacher, but if they're in a classroom, how do you suggest teachers manage that? Yeah, great question. Here's how we've seen it implemented in a classroom-based model. So students are able to access all their curriculum at all their own pace, and teachers are essential to this role, where they're in their own classrooms around the building or roaming, and they spin up little mini workshops. This is what, just a really tactical example. A teacher in math spins up a workshop on division or multiplication at 11 a.m. for 20 minutes. Everyone who is struggling with some not yets around multiplication, you're going to go to this little workshop by this teacher for 20 minutes and see if you can get through some of those not yets. A English teacher is going to do one on writing persuasive essays at 2 p.m., Go to the 2 p.m. slot for the, anyone who has a not yet in your persuasive essay category. And you go over there and students do it for 15 or 20 minutes. And the teacher then works one-on-one -on -one with kids during the other times who is struggling with not yet so that they haven't been able to master. So that's how I see it in a classroom is teachers roaming with expertise and doing little mini workshops on topics where kids are struggling. That they've looked at the dashboard, you can see who's not yet, invite them personally to join your little workshop. Does that help? It does, yeah. That's what we call micro-teaching sessions when other kids are doing um, actively learning at a different learning center. That's Thank it. you for that. Nice job. Amazing. Thank you for that. Who else wants to talk to Matt? Let's see these hands. There's a lot of questions. And you know what? I think Matt can stay here all day with the amount of information and impact you're doing. We don't have time for you to continue okay. questioning, but you do have time coming up for the coffee. So you got a lot of hands up in the air. Be sure to catch these guys out later for in the day. All right? Give them a round of applause. Thanks Matt so has done incredible, incredible.